Chapter 21 He drives to the abandoned zoo. Lunch of his sister always puts him on edge, not to such an extent that he stops going but he feels the need to collect himself afterward in order to understand why this person who's part of his family is the way she is, why she has the children she does, why she's never cared about him or their father. He walks slowly past the monkey cages. They're broken. The trees that were planted inside them have dried up. He reads one of the signs. Its letters discolored. Howler monkey. Aloata Karaya Class Mammals Next to the word mammals, there's an obscene drawing. Order, primates, family, atelidae, habitat, woods, adaptations. The females have golden or yellowish fur, while that of the male, the words that follow, are worn away. They have special features that enable them to produce sounds. Their larynx and hyoid bone in particular are highly developed, the latter forming a large capsule that amplifies their vocalizations diet plants insects and fruits conservation status out of danger the words out of danger are crossed out distribution central zone of south america from eastern bolivia and southern brazil to northern argentina and paraguay there's a photo of a male howler monkey the monkey's face is contorted, as though the camera captured the moment it was caught. Someone has drawn a red circle with a cross in the center. He goes into one of the cages. There's grass growing up between the cracks in the cement. Cigarettes and needles on the floor. He finds bones. Thinks they could have been one of the monkeys. Or not. They could be anything. There are trees outside the cage. He leaves it to walk beneath them. It's a hot day and the sky is clear. The trees provide a bit of shade. He's sweating. He comes across a sales booth. When he sticks his hand through the empty door frame, he finds cans, papers, filth. Inside, he reads the list of products painted on the wall. Simba the stuffed lion, Rita the stuffed giraffe, Dumbo the stuffed elephant, Animal Kingdom cup, Squirrel monkey pencil case. The white walls are covered with graffiti, sentences, drawings. Someone has written I miss the animals in small restrained letters. Someone else crossed out and added, I hope you die for being so dumb. When he leaves the sales booth, he lights a cigarette. He never wanders around the zoo, but instead always goes straight to the lion's den and sits there. He knows the zoo is large because he remembers spending hours exploring it with his father. He steps down into some empty swimming pools. The pools are small. They could have held otters or seals, he thinks, but can't remember. The signs have been worn off. As he walks, he rolls up his sleeve. He undoes the button on his shirt and leaves it open, loose. In the distance, he sees huge cages. They're tall, topped with cupolas. He remembers the avery, the colorful birds flying, birds of feathers, the smell both dense and fragile. When he reaches the cages, he sees it's actually one cage split into sections. Inside, there's a large hanging bridge covered by a glass copula, which once allowed visitors to walk among the birds. The doors are broken. The trees that were planted inside the cage grew up and broke through parts of the glass copulas over the roof and bridge. He steps on leaves and shards of glass, feels them crunch beneath his boots. There's a staircase up to the hanging bridge. He climbs it and decides to cross the bridge. He walks through branches, steps over them, pushes them out of his way. In a clearing, he looks up to the roof and sees the treetops and one of the cupolas, the one in the center. It's the only one made of stained glass and has an image of a man with wings flying close to the sun. He recognizes Icarus, knows of his fate. The wings are made of different colors and Icarus is flying through a sky that's full of birds as though they were keeping him company, as though this human were one of them. He picks up a branch with leaves on it and cleans the floor of the bridge a little so he can lie down without cutting himself on the glass. 
Some parts of the cupola are broken, but it's the least damage of them all because it's highest and furthest from the branches of the trees which haven't yet reached it. He wishes he could spend the whole day lying down there looking at the multicolored sky. He would have liked to show this Avery to his son, just as it is empty broken. A memory strikes him of his sister's phone calls when Leo died. She only spoke to Cecilia as though his wife were the only one who needed to be consoled. At the funeral, crying, she held on to her children as though she feared they too would die a sudden death, as though the baby in the basket had the ability to infect others with its fate. He looked at everyone as though the road had distanced itself a few meters. It was as though the people embracing him were behind frosted glass. He wasn't able to cry, not once, not even when he saw the little white coffin being lowered into the ground. What he was thinking was that he wished the coffin was less conspicuous. He knew it was white because of the purity of the child inside. But are we really that pure when we arrive in this world? He wondered. He thought of other lives, thought that maybe in another dimension, on another planet, in another era, he might find himself with his son, watch him grow. And while he was thinking about all of this, and people were throwing roses onto the coffin, his sister cried as though the child were her own. Nor did he cry later, after the simulacrum of a funeral that was still expected back then. When the guests had left and the two of them remained, the cemetery employees lifted the coffin back up, wiped away the earth and flowers that had been thrown on it, and took it to a room. They removed his son's body from the white coffin and placed it in one that was transparent. He and Cecilia had to watch their baby slowly enter the oven that would cremate him. Cecilia collapsed and was taken into another room with armchairs that were set up for this purpose. He received the ashes and signed the papers that verified that his son had been cremated and that they had witnessed it. He leaves the Avery and walks past the kid's playground. The slide is broken. There's a seat saw that's missing one of its seats. The merry-go-round, shaped like a spinning top, has retained its color green, but swastikas have been painted on its wooden floor. Grass is growing in the sandbox, and someone has placed a rickety chair in the middle of it and left it there to rot. Only one swing is left. He sits down on it and lights a cigarette. The chains still hold his weight. He swings by moving his legs gently, his feet touching the ground. Then he starts to pump his legs lifting his feet into the air and sees that in distance the clouds are forming in the sky. It's a hot day. He takes off his shirt and ties it around his waist. Not far from the playground, he sees another cage. He goes over to it and reads the sign. Sulfur Crested Cockatoo, Cockatoo Gaurida, Class Avis, Order Piscitacaforms, Family Piscitacidae. Someone has written, I love you, Romina, in red letters over the description of the habitat. Adaptations. Males have eyes the color of dark coffee, while the female's eyes are red. During courtship, the male raises his crest and moves his head in a figure eight while he emits vocalizations. Both parents take responsibility for incubating and feeding the chicks. The bird lives to about 40 years of age in the wild and to almost 65 in captivity. There's a record of a cockatoo that lived to over 120. The rest of the sign is broken and lying on the floor, but he doesn't bend down to pick it up. He walks over to a large building. The door frame has been burned. The building contains a room with big windows that have been broken. He thinks the space must have been a bar or restaurant. There are built-in chairs that weren't removed. Most of the tables are gone, but two remain soldered to the floor. There's an elongated structure that could have been a bar. When he sees the sign, Serpentarium, in an arrow, he walks through the hallways that are dark and narrow until he reaches a bigger space with wide windows. There's another sign painted on the wall. It says, Serpentarium, please wait in line. He goes into a room with a high ceiling, part of which is broken. The sky shows through the cracks. There are no cages. Instead, the walls are divided into compartments by glass panels. He thinks they're called terrariums. There were once different serpents inside them. 
Some of the glass panels are broken. Others have disappeared completely. He sits down on the floor and pulls out a cigarette. As he looks around at the graffiti and drawings, an image catches his attention. It's a mask that someone has drawn with a good deal of skill. It looks like a Venetian mask. Beside it, in a large black letters, the person has written, The mask of apparent calm, of mundane tranquility, of the joy, at once small and bright, of not knowing when this thing I call skin will be ripped off. When this thing I call mouth will lose the flesh that surrounds it. When these things I call eyes will come upon the black silence of a night. It's not signed. No one has scratched it or drawn over it. But words and images surround it. He reads some of the things people have written. Black market. Why don't you rip this? Meat with a first and last name tastes best. Joy? Small and bright? Seriously? Law. Awesome poem. After the curfew, we can eat you. This world is shit. YOLO. Oh, eat of me. Eat of my flesh. Oh, amongst cannibals. Oh, take your time to cut me up. Oh, amongst cannibals. Sodia stereo forever. As he's trying to remember what YOLO means, he hears a sound. He keeps still. It's a faint cry. He gets up and walks through the serpentarium to one of the largest windows. It's intact. It's hard for him to make anything out. There are dry branches on the floor filth but he sees a body move and then suddenly tiny head lifts up as a black snout and two brown ears then he makes out another head and another he stands there watching them thinks he's hallucinating then he feels an urge to break the glass so he can touch them at first he doesn't understand how he got there but then he realizes there are three terrariums connected by doors and that the glass surrounding two of them is broken they're not on ground level which is why he has to climb up to enter them he gets down on all fours and crawls through the door to the largest terrarium the one is in the middle which is where the puppies are the door is open the terrarium is wide and fairly tall he thinks it would have held an anaconda or a python the puppies whimper they're frightened, of course, he thinks. They've never seen a human in their lives. He crawls along carefully because the floor is covered in stones, dry leaves, filth. The puppies are beneath some branches that do a fairly good job of sheltering them. The branches around which a boa might have wrapped itself, he thinks. They're curled up next to each other to keep warm and to protect themselves. He sits down close by but doesn't touch them until they're calmer. Then he starts to pet the puppies. There are four of them. They're scrawny and filthy. They sniff his hand. He picks one of them up. It hardly weighs a thing. At first it trembles. Then it begins to move desperately. It urinates out of fear. The others bark, whimper. He hugs the puppy, kisses it until it calms down. The puppy runs its tongue along his face. He laughs and cries silently.